Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe they look alike or something. Oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> the name's not the same, brother. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Hash, and I'm here from the White House Office of Health Reform. Uh, I bring regrets, sincere regrets, from uh, my boss, Nancy Ann DeParle, who had fully intended to be here, but as many of you, most of you, if not all of you around this table know, the pace of the health reform activity has quickened of late. And uh, in fact, on the Hill, there are markups going on and hearings being prepared, and she's been uh, pulled away to, to handle some crises in that area and very much regrets that she can't uh, be with us uh, this afternoon. So I apologize on, on behalf of her. The first thing I want to do is to thank all of you uh, who are very busy people for taking time out to come to be with us here today um, and uh, to participate in this third uh, White House Physicians Forum that we've hosted. Um, we're also, as you may notice from the camera over here, uh, being streamed on the web. Um, for those of you uh, who are not in the room, uh, you can follow all this at uh, whitehouse.gov uh, or at www.healthreform.gov. And in addition, uh, we're enlarging the opportunity for participation at today's forum uh, by also having a link with Facebook um, so that people who are interested in participating in this discussion and sharing their views with us, uh, we'll be able to do so um, via Facebook. So uh, obviously the group today is, is much larger than the ones of us just sitting around this uh, table. Um, Jan uh, Canestra, who's from our office right over here, uh, is, um, uh, being, uh, is watching the web and keeping up with um, what we're getting in the way of reactions and comments from our virtual audience uh, that's out there uh, interested in what we're talking about. Uh, let me just say something, I think, again about uh, something you all know, which is uh, the President has a, a deep uh, and very real commitment uh, to health care reform. He's talked about it, uh, obviously, all during the campaign and since he's been in office. Um, and he, he's really committed uh, to the kind of comprehensive health reform uh, that slows the rate of uh, health care cost growth, preserves choice, and by that he means choice of, of plan, choice of physician, choice of provider, uh, and he wants to make sure uh, that affordable, quality health coverage uh, is available to all Americans. Um, he, he believes that this kind of reform is, is clearly more than just a, a social imperative. Uh, it's really an economic uh, necessity. Uh, and the current system that we're in, in terms of its cost growth, is just one that's not sustainable uh, over the long haul. Um, without, uh, without doing something about bending the cost curve, uh, I think all of us recognize that the, the rate of increase in health premiums for those fortunate enough to have coverage will continue to escalate and will burden severely uh, workers, family, and their families, and certainly uh, businesses and government as well. So um, we, we really cannot uh, afford to risk uh, not addressing this and, and, and not addressing the particular levers we have um, as federal programs in the, in the form of Medicare and Medicaid, um, because uh, clearly this cost curve is uh, contributing significantly to the federal deficit over time. Um, now, everybody, I think, knows that what we're here to talk about today uh, is the very important subject of prevention and wellness and strategies for promoting that, uh, both so that we can improve the health of all Americans, as you know so well, uh, but at the same time, also, I believe, achieve greater efficiencies and, and cost, uh, cost containment as a result of that. Uh, and, and the idea here is wellness involves not just um, uh, what practitioners do, but clearly um, behavior and, and, uh, and uh, the, the um, opportunities that people have to take charge of their lives and take responsibility uh, for their lifestyle. Uh, this is why um, President Obama is committed uh, to the kind of reform uh, that I just described and why he feels so uh, deeply about the importance, the critical importance of including prevention, wellness uh, as a part of any kind of comprehensive health reform. 
So with that kind of a frame and, and overview, I want to talk, uh, I want to turn to uh, Dr. Dora Hughes, who is counselor to uh, HHS Secretary Sebelius for Public Health and Science, and for her to make a few remarks, and then I'm going to introduce some of my other colleagues up here. Dora? Good afternoon, and thank you. Um, just to, to echo Mike's comments, obviously this president has been committed to prevention and public health for many years at this point. Uh, while he was in the Senate, he introduced a number of public health bills. Uh, certainly with the campaign, we saw that one third of his campaign health plan focused squarely on prevention and public health. Uh, through ARA, the Recovery Act, we were able to uh, to successfully advocate for a billion dollars in funding for prevention and wellness activities that uh, we've made some progress in rolling out already. And we're going to carry that same fight, that same uh, advocacy uh, for meaningful inclusion of prevention and public health in, in the health reform package that uh, we're starting to negotiate now. Uh, the President has always said our health care system is a disease care system and that that simply must change. Uh, as, uh, as Bob often likes to point out, uh, although we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world, uh, it certainly has not made any of us any healthier. If we look at our rankings, we rank last among 19 developed countries in terms of preventable mortality. And we know that there are so many opportunities uh, to improve that. Uh, in addition, if we look at how we spend our money, we're focusing quite a bit on reducing costs. Uh, that 85% of healthcare spending goes towards treatment of chronic conditions. Uh, and yet, at the same time, only less than four cents of every dollar goes toward prevention and public health, which could prevent many of these chronic conditions in the first place or certainly delay them for a number of years. Uh, I think as doctors, uh, all of us know that what happens just beyond our clinic doors, just beyond the hospital doors, has, uh, is, is equal in a role or perhaps a greater role uh, uh, in improving the health of our patients. Uh, and yet, at the same time, we also know that what we do in our clinic settings uh, can be improved. If we look at the statistics, we know that only 28% of smokers are offered tobacco cessation services. Only 37% of adults are vaccinated against seasonal flu. We know the statistics for healthcare workers are equally dismal. Uh, and then less than half of adults over the age of 50 are screened for colorectal cancer. These are both cost-effective services and sometimes also cost-saving uh, services. And that's why we believe that doctors must continue to be part of the drumbeat for inclusion and prevention and wellness and health reform. And that we also have to focus not just on the clinical setting, but also community-based settings. It has to be a seamless continuum uh, between the two if we're going to have the greatest impact on the health of our patients. And so today, frankly, we're looking for your ideas, your recommendations, uh, helping to identify the opportunities uh, for provisions uh, relating to prevention and public health and health reform uh, that's happening right now, as well as uh, in our general departmental and White House activities, uh, looking even more broadly. So with that, I'll turn it over to Zeke to, to weigh in. So uh, I'm Zeke Emanuel, and I know a fair number of you in the room. Uh, I'm an oncologist uh, and had been at the NIH for 12 years before this and now working in the uh, Office of Management and Budget for uh, Peter Orzag on health care reform. I want to add my welcome to you. This is actually the third physician group we've had. It's been quite important to us, and we've learned a lot from having the physicians here. Obviously, uh, interacting with the patient is the key way healthcare gets delivered. Um, and this is a slightly different episode in that we are trying to understand more about the prevention side of it and uh, how we can facilitate that. Um, so I just want to add my welcome and, and thanks for your attendance. And I have three other physician colleagues who are valued participants in the health reform team here in the White House and the HHS. So often, if you all introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Bob Kocher. I work on the National Economic Council, where my focus is on health care, cost, and quality. I'm particularly interested today in, in, I think, the theme that will come out around how to have a step change in the quality and productivity of the system and reducing the variation in care so that the system is much less chance-based and much more likely evidence-based. So I'm looking forward to your thoughts, and I thank many of you for your contributions uh, through your careers and also over the last several months on health care reform and sharing your ideas. 
I'm Mina Seishmani. I'm an um, otolaryngologist and a health economist. And I work as the Director of Policy Analysis in the Office of Health Reform for Health and Human Services. And I'd like to also thank everyone for coming. I think it makes such a difference having physicians very involved in this whole process. And um, with my bent of, you know, the analytical side of me, I'm interested to hear your thoughts in terms of, you know, the methodologies and how we go about figuring out where to invest the money in prevention and how we can show benefits that we get and where to best use resources. Hi, I'm Kavita Patel. I also feel like I'm in a room of friends. I'm the Director of Policy for Intergovernmental Affairs and Public Engagement. I'm an internist by training and had a primary care practice for a while, so this topic is near and dear to my heart and would also like to hear about some of the practical aspects of some of the trade-offs and, and decisions you have to make when you're talking about prevention and wellness in clinical settings and how that comes into play when you're also wrestling with time and, and some of the other decisions that you have to make. So thank you. Um, uh, we don't want to take up a huge amount of your time doing this, but I think it would be useful if we went around the room and briefly introduced ourselves, starting with Lloyd. Yes, I'm Lloyd Dean, President and CEO of uh, Catholic Healthcare West, which is headquartered uh, in San Francisco, California, and we are a very large network of uh, hospitals and other supportive uh, healthcare services. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Joanne Smith, and I'm the President and CEO of the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, and uh, we are the nation's uh, leading rehabilitation provider and actually the, the world's largest research, rehabilitation research hospital uh, of our kind. And I'm Greg Kerfman, the executive editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and in my previous life, a preventive cardiologist. I'm Omega Logan Silva. I'm the a past president of the American Medical Women's Association, and I worked for 29 years at the VA doing research, uh, administration, and taking care of veterans. I'm Dr. Charles Vermont. I'm from Prescott, Arkansas, a little town uh, north of Hope, which is a famous place. <laughs> uh, I've been in uh, general and family practice there for 22 years, and prior to that, I went to medical school at the University of Arkansas, and prior to that, I was a physician assistant in a little town called DeQueen, which is also in southwest Arkansas, and I see about 45 to 50 patients a day, direct contact one way or another, and sometimes a lot more. So I'm, I'm in the trenches. Hi, I'm Don Berwick. I'm a pediatrician, and I'm president and CEO of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI. We're a nonprofit organization that works on improving healthcare all over the world. Hi, my name is Alice Chen. I am a hospitalist at UCLA and a clinical instructor there as well. I'm also the executive director of Doctors for America. I'm here with several of my colleagues from Doctors for America. We're a grassroots group of thousands of physicians across the country in all 50 states. And the four of us are here at this table, not, not to be ourselves, but to represent our 13,000 members. And we've brought their, their comments with us. <laughs> Give us a hernia, right? <laughs> I'm Tim Williams, full-time clinical practice, radiation oncology, Boca Raton, Florida, and president of the American Society for Therapy and Radiology. Walter Willett, I'm a chair of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard School of Public Health, and primarily do research on nutrition and lifestyle in the prevention of chronic disease. I'm Neil Halfin. I'm a professor of pediatrics and health services and public policy at UCLA. I direct the UCLA Center for Healthier Children, Families, and Communities, and also direct something called the Blue Sky Health Initiative. Uh, I'm Susan Blumenthal, and uh, I am the director of the Health and Medicine Program at the Center for the Presidency and Congress. We're with the uh, president of the Mayo Clinic co-chair and commission on new directions in health and medicine, where we've underscored the power of prevention. Uh, prior to that, for 20 years, served in the federal government as assistant uh, surgeon general and the first deputy assistant secretary for women's health. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Willarda Edwards, and I am president-elect of the National Medical Association, and I am an internist in, in uh, an internist in private practice in Baltimore, Maryland, just down the street. <laughs> and I caught the rain coming here, but happy to be here. But two beltways away. <laughs> My name is Vivek Murthy. Very happy to be here with all of you. I'm the president and co-founder of Doctors for America and also a hospitalist uh, at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. Hi, my name is Jen Kinestra. I work in the Office of Health Reform. I'm going to be the connection to all of the comments that are being submitted on Facebook and on health reform. 
Whitehouse.gov as well as Whitehouse.gov. And for that matter, um, I have the first comment. Um, this was one submitted to Facebook. People can live chat as well as submit questions right now. And the comment is, for those working 12 to 16 hours a day, preventive health care can be very difficult. For example, struggling with child care. Uh, the key question would be, how can we make it easier for people to focus on prevention? Well, let's hold the question, though, yeah. in the introduction. Because that's, that, that's a hard question that will take more than a second to answer. Yeah. Okay, Diane. My name's Diane Meyer. I'm a geriatrician and a palliative care doctor from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City, and I direct the Center to Advance Palliative Care. Kim Garson, I'm the Provost of the University of Virginia, and if any of you know what that is, you can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a recovery medical school dean there, and uh, started the Master's of Public Health program in the past month in American College of Cardiology. Good afternoon. I'm Craig Houston. I'm the executive vice president Partnership for Prevention. Um, we're a national independent nonprofit here in Washington, D.C. And for the past 18 years, we've been totally devoted to getting evidence based prevention and health promotion into our health systems. Obviously, I'm thrilled that we're talking about prevention. I started out as a family practice physician and then switched over to the public health side. I was at CDC for almost 15 years. I'm Rahul Rajkumar. I'm in the last week of my internal medicine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also trained as an attorney with a background in health law and policy, and I'm here uh, to represent the Doctors and Doctors for America. I'm Judy Bigby. I'm the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the state of Massachusetts. Prior to that, I uh, practiced primary care for 25 years, um, and also uh, um, ran a Brigham and Women's Hospital's uh, community health program. And then her real claim to fame is she survived me as a medical student. So. <laughs> <laughs> Barely. <laughs> I won't tell. <laughs> Joe Thompson, a pediatrician and prevention specialist in Arkansas. I am served as the Surgeon General Cabinet Level Advisor to Democratic Governor Beebe, formerly Republican Governor Huckabee. I can attest that. Now, you were the weight loss program that he's the, the guy. No, uh, <laughs> and, and most recently, we are assisting the Broward Johnson Foundation with the National Center for Prevention and Obesity. I'm Lisa Louisa Mori. I'm a geriatrician and internist and the President and CEO of the Robert Johnson Foundation. Uh, our mission is to improve health and health care. Hi, I'm Nikhil Wadley, co-founder of Doctors for America. Uh, like Alice said, we're representing more than 13,000 members. I'm also an oncology fellow at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. I'm Chuck Ginsburg, and I'm a pediatrician. I was uh, chairman of pediatrics at uh, UT Southwestern for 18 years, and now I'm the interim dean. Uh, UT Southwestern. So I wanted to uh, kick us off. Um, as uh, all of you know, uh, we are in the thick of uh, health care reform. And uh, the purpose here really is for us to solicit and get uh, good ideas that are actionable in this process. Uh, I think as Mike correctly and Dora correctly point out, uh, this president is very much focused uh, on, uh, I would say, two themes. One is the need to change the rate of growth of health care costs so that it's sustainable and doesn't bankrupt the country and families and businesses. And the other is he has made prevention, as Dora mentioned, central, not just while he's president, but before. He's deeply committed to this. And the reason for this group is to give us, uh, as I said, actionable ideas that we can actually uh, think about how to implement uh, as part of health care reform that are really is going to promote that uh, prevention agenda. One of the ground rules we like to have uh, in these physician meetings, frequently people come in with prepared speeches. We really want a discussion, not prepared statements from you know, various groups. 
And so um, I would try to kick it off by asking people for their best idea about how to really prevent uh, uh, our future uh, trend, if, uh, which we seem to be on, which is ever-growing obesity with the consequence uh, that is just would be devastating to the country if we don't get off that curve. Uh, as all of you know, it has tremendous implications for diabetes, heart disease, and therefore uh, just the huge cost. Uh, so maybe we'll start there, and obviously that will lead us to lots of different uh, places. So. Can we just jump right in? As we jump right in, I had two ideas and right. given the question that was raised on the Facebook initially. Mm -hmm. That was first of all that in the school systems we need to get back to the whole issue of teaching nutrition and health wellness and prevention in, in terms of letting patients and letting children know about the need for exercise on a regular basis and then having that be put that in, back into the schools, the opportunity for them to have a recess and some activities and some health education as well about hypertension, cholesterol, the things that they should be checking, and the fact that we know that many of them, the children are the ones that go back home and tell their parents that they shouldn't be smoking or that they should be not eating the, the bad foods that they're eating. Uh, additionally, when it comes down to that question, particularly about adults, the recommendations that I have had heard from other people is that why don't we have more time being set aside in our work days, in our uh, two-week pay periods, where you take at least four hours, give the employees at least four hours in which they can use that time <coughs> for making that dental appointment, seeing that ophthalmologist, having their urology check or their GYN check. And that would be a one way, uh, if you did it every month or once a quarter, that would be an opportunity for people to really do something in terms of prevention that would be uh, more helpful than the sick care that we've been given for many years. Sure. Uh, University of Virginia, we tested the idea of color coding the food and drinks in the vending machines, red, yellow, green, uh, and charged an 8% fat tax on red. Um, at the end of the year, sales on the red went down 5%, sales on the, red, on the yellow went up 30%, sales on the green went up 15%, total sales went up 5%. We got seven thousand dollars in nickels that we put into the child and exercise program. Mm -hmm. uh, this is being done better at Dallas Children's Hospital, where they have color coded each of the colors a different price. So green is eighty-five cents, uh, yellow is ninety, and red is a dollar. So there's an eighteen percent differential. Uh, that's just getting started. So it's an idea. Uh, it, it's not just sugary drinks, folks. Um, they're actually, at the children's right down the street from you, they're going to color code their cafeterias and their, ultimately, the kids' trays. Great. So just, a, just a pretty actionable idea. Lisa, I know you've, this has been a passion of yours. Creating a knowledge bank, a virtual knowledge bank of best practices 
that would be available. Um, you know, when we give out research grants or demonstration projects, we don't really ask for the results. People publish them in scientific journals, but we don't ask for them back in a user-friendly way so that they could be posted on a, a website of, because in certain communities they'll never get a grant, but if they could have a cookbook of how to establish a smoking prevention community program or a healthy nutrition program in their community, they could uh, customize that to their community, along with clinical practice guidelines for prevention. Speak I think would be helpful. Speaking of website, I, we might want to open the discussion up to the Facebook.com users and the yeah. uh, um, Whitehouse.gov. Yeah, someone who just submitted a comment slash question on obesity, and uh, they said uh, on Facebook, if they want to fund illness prevention, I wonder if any funding will go for funding PE classes in schools to deal with childhood obesity and diabetes. So I don't know if anyone can specifically talk about that, but um, we'd certainly love to hear thoughts. Well, you know, I, I would, that was on, on, on my list, and I think, you know, one of the things that we're called to do, particularly us that are here today, is that, you know, we know that uh, prevention can make a difference. Uh, there's no question about that. But I think the question that's before us is to step back and ask ourselves, okay, if we know that and the, there's evidence to support that, why hasn't prevention, uh, you know, penetrated uh, the population that uh, we're talking about? And I think it's much more complex than uh, perhaps uh, we like to think. Uh, number one is I think that uh, exercise, physical education in a school must become mandatory. I don't think it uh, can be an option. Uh, number two, I think that uh, nutritional education, both within uh, the schools, um, is essential. Uh, number three, I think that it's very important that when we talk about prevention, we bridge to primary care. We talk about uh, medical homes. We talk about uh, practitioners having enough time to educate. We know that there's been tons of study. Don has done studies. We know the role of the physician and the, and, and the health practitioner in terms of dealing with patients and those kinds of things. Uh, and also, I, I, I think that within the broad, if you will, funding mechanism uh, for health reform, we've got to make sure that there are dollars set aside with specific qualitative and quantitative measurements so that we can track the value in the progress of our prevention efforts. Well, I want to second the comments that this really does have to be multifaceted. We did a little review of the report and came to the same conclusion that Robert Wood Johnson did. But, uh, you know, uh, Specifically, you know, focusing on very specific targets, when we look at childhood obesity across the studies, the two factors that cons consistently show up in many studies, actually for adults as well, it are the number of hours of television watched per day and consumption of sugary beverages. And I think at this point in time, the really lowest hanging fruit is the sugary beverage area. About half of the 300 calorie a day increase we've had in this country per person over the last three decades has been sugary beverages. And they're directly related now to weight gain, directly related to diabetes and now coronary heart disease. I, I think it's something we need to take on like we did in tobacco. We've made big progress there, and that's a good example. Uh, right, I know it's being discussed on the now. I think taxation is a very powerful uh, tool there. And combined with education can have a very big impact one of the problems with sugary beverages is it's too easy to overconsume them, but the studies are showing it's actually relatively easy for the same reason to give them up as well. And with that tax invested in uh, school physical activity programs and nutrition programs, and the public with the polls have shown will back that kind of taxation you know, with a very strong majority. That's not the only target, but that's a, a very good one, I think. Good yeah. Um, I, I agree with everything people have said. I just want to um, relay some experience that we've had in Massachusetts, which underscores what I think is a fundamental problem in that our public health prevention dollars are dwarfed by what we're paying on uh, for medical care and by fun NIH funding as well. Um, what I found now that we have 97 plus percent of the population covered is that we are still spending precious public health dollars in medical care settings doing um, individual counseling, education, 
things that the medical setting should carry out, but the reason that's true is because of the way we pay for care. Um, I think that that payment system doesn't recognize the progress that we've made in understanding the value of prevention and also uh, chronic disease management. So what we're doing is, at least where we have control with state dollars, uh, moving away from a see a patient every 15 minutes, we want to pay uh, providers to do full management of uh, their patients from a prevention and chronic disease management, pay them for doing health education, uh, counseling, um, engaging individuals in uh, their own care and behavior change and moving our public health dollars out of the medical care setting into the community. So we've started an initiative where we're um, helping cities and towns develop comprehensive approaches to workplace, school, and community wellness and using those public health dollars for population interventions that will uh, marry with what we're doing in the medical care setting. I think as long as we approach this as a one-by-one -one issue, we're not going to succeed. Smoking is a great example of the multifaceted approaches that we have to take. And as long as we are using public health dollars to um, make up for the fact that some people aren't covered or we're not paying for the right things in the medical setting, um, we will not be able to use those dollars. Can you say a little bit more about how you're changing the payment system to incentivize more time? Mm -hmm. So, um, or more through focus. our Medicaid program in January, we'll, we will implement a um, model in community health centers across the state where we will uh, be working with them as primary care providers to um, basically implement a patient centered medical home with clear um, ability for them to define their practices that incorporates um, counseling, uh, intervention, not by disease state, but uh, again based on uh, the prevalence of chronic illness, uh, we'll support them through our HIT initiatives to make sure they have disease registries. They'll be uh, uniform quality outcomes that we'll be looking at that will include uh, patient satisfaction, but also some of the things that we know are important in terms of quality standards for particular diseases, emergency room visits, that sort of thing. And then um, we have, in our Department of Public Health, uh, <coughs> tried to marry where we're focusing public health dollars in these same communities so that the medical practices have partners in the community to help them uh, get their individuals out to walk or are you incentivizing physicians and patients in some way also to kind of take advantage of these things? Um, I don't believe that we have any specific patient incentives. Um, we do, the, the model that we're looking at is a, um, a payment model that includes both fee for service, a per member per month payment, but then a pay for performance measure as well that does incentivize. Mark and then Rahul, I know you've both been waiting. You know, I, I think the uh, most important aspect to focus on, other than community-based interventions and prevention wellness on a national sort of basis, is how do we feel chronic disease is really driven through changes in, in, in lifestyle? And that if we don't actually reimburse or uh, create a mechanism within healthcare reform that actually pays for physicians and community teams and uh, ancillary health professionals to create interventions based on lifestyle,
best available treatment. We know, for example, last week the New England Journal showed that diabetes patients did not improve outcomes by giving surgical or anti-plastic interventions, and, and they were equivalent to medical therapy, which doesn't work as well as lifestyle interventions which have been proven. So uh, we know from the first trial that, that anti-plastic don't really improve outcomes in the way We know that lifestyle does, and the problem is we don't have a mechanism for reversing comprehensive, coordinated, integrated teams that are accountable for results, that drive innovation in healthcare, innovation in delivering lifestyle services, and drive innovation in, um, in, re in, in primary care practice. Because we're, we're really also facing a primary care shortage. And, and this is, there's gotta be a mechanism for changing that payment based on utilization to you know, bundle payments for, we have to spend a DRG for a lifestyle intervention treatment. But it shouldn't have to be held in terms of a cost scoring uh, metric to the same thing as other preventive strategies because it's really a treatment. We don't value bypass or any plastic or any medication saying it has to save money to be paid for. We pay for it because it, it's a treatment. In this way, even though this will save money, it's easy to pay for the treatment. So this is really the whole proposal is called Take Back Your Health, the game changing strategy for reducing costs and improving outcomes. So I think it's very specific and hopefully you can see it get through. Cool. Yes, I wanted to uh, just And then Corrine. <laughs> Uh, and then after you, Rahul, and then we're going to flip to the other side of the room. Oh, so just, excuse me, just, um, if, if you guys still have your cell phones on, I just want to reiterate that um, just make sure everybody has them off because we're going to start interjecting with some online comments. But please just double check that your cell phones are off. Thank you. And my thoughts. So uh, I just wanted to reinforce the idea that many of the things that are driving our ill health and our health care costs are behaviors, and those are rooted more in the communities we live in where we work, where we play, than it is in our health care system. Our clinician can tell us you need to walk more, but if there's no sidewalks or safe place to walk, it doesn't do any good. If he says eat fruit and vegetables, but you're in a food desert, it doesn't do any good. So I'd like, in addition to what I've heard, um, give you two other things that I don't think I've heard mentioned. The first is we do really need to look at our non-health policies, like our, how we construct our cities, our transportation policies, our food policies, and do health impact assessments so that at least we know what the health impacts of those policies are. We may still do them, but at least we have a better sense of what the health outcomes are likely to be. And the second thing, and it builds on uh, Dr. Vicky's uh, comments, we really do have to have a sustained, um, sufficient funding source for our public health infrastructure, because many of these community interventions, whether it's educating the communities about how to do interventions or what they should be, do lie under the responsibility of our public health system, and yet we traditionally have woefully underfunded public health, and so therefore the communities don't know what are the evidence-based interventions that they should be implementing. So I just like to add those two recommendations to your list. I'm going to actually ask a question that was submitted to whitehouse.gov, and anyone should feel free to answer. Um, but the question is, what measures should we be taking to address disease prevention since so many of our chronic illnesses like heart disease and diabetes are preventable with the right treatment? So I don't know if anyone wants to So Rahul, cool. why, why don't you take that since you're in the front lines? <laughs> I'm happy to take that question. I want to just to echo what Dr. Bigby and Dr. Hyman were saying. I think one of the things that we can do, this is something that we hear from all of our 13,000 members, is to make prevention pay. Uh, one of the examples that was sent in to us, uh, which is really quite shocking, is that Medicare will pay $68,000 for a year's worth of Avastin for stage four lung cancer, which is clinically unproven, but pays only about $15 to $20 for a moderate amount of tobacco counseling, tobacco cessation counseling. Uh, and that too, only if you can link it to a tobacco-related illness. So really quite a shocking disparity in the way that things are paid for. And you know, I'll leave it to people like Dr. Vicky, Dr. Hyman, and, and all of you to come up with innovative solutions to this. But as a matter of process, one thing that we would really ask is that you find ways of including rank and file doctors, people who are on the front lines of our systems, in this discussion. Uh, because what we have here is, is uh, you know, the leadership of medicine, and it's really an honor to sit at this table, but not people who are out in the community. And you know, the people that I think of are people like my parents, who are both in community practice, who really are not engaged in the political process and don't understand what is going on in terms of health care. Well, I'll Dr. Take Vermont. A, yeah, I'm in the community. Um, <laughs> there's an old saying health is wealth. And when I was growing up, uh, 
fresh air, you ate right, you got exercise, because in the 1950s we didn't have this, all this amazing science. And our parents had gone through the Depression in World War II. My father survived diphtheria, and it was health is wealth. Uh, Dr. Blumenthal made a good point, and the point is health needs to become a, a cause celeb. Uh, we, uh, like global warming, uh, uh, or, uh, or like Susan Komen, like, uh, you know, prevention of breast cancer, treatment of breast cancer. Um, the gentleman from Harvard, uh, you can tax soda, but you're up against the Coke and Smile, okay? And, and all the other advertising and all the other lifestyle things that go with American life. And so if you want a healthy society, uh, uh, you're going you're to have to make health a, a, a premium product in people's lives. I mean, good health is a lifelong achievement. You know. Don? Um, I agree with everything that's been said. I'll just add a few other thoughts. Uh, I co-chaired the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Don't let prevention escape the rigor and discipline of scientific study. U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is a fabulous investment, and I think it should be continued and, and, and beefed up. There's too much. There's a lot of political correctness around prevention. Keep it scientific. The second, uh, I, I'm intrigued by uh, the importance of population health measures. I think there's progress being made, and the CDC had some pretty interesting stuff going on, but we, we really should nail that now and be able to tell a community or a subset of a community what the health status is in that community over time and in rapid cycles. Uh, third, um, the, um, the, I think it'd be helpful for our thinking, your thinking, to, to distinguish primary and secondary prevention, as Mark was talking about. Secondary prevention saves a ton of money. It's very effective and preserves life and ex extends life, and it's important and requires integrated care systems to do it properly, I think. Primary prevention is what we've talked about a lot. I don't think we can expect to save a lot of money with primary prevention. The evidence doesn't support that idea, but we, we, are, we can do, have to deliver a far healthier population. I'd encourage that. For the secondary prevention component, I'm, I'm very impressed by what properly run community health centers can do, and I think there could be a federal mainstay effort in community, federally qualified community health centers to make secondary prevention especially world-class everywhere. They could be the prototypes because they're integrated to start with. Uh, two other quick things. I'm intrigued also by work going around the country on health risk appraisal as a becoming a kind of regular vital sign. Green Bay, Wisconsin, where the president just was, Bell and Health is trying to really regularize health risk appraisal as a starting place, and I like it. It, it avoids spreading everything where it's not needed and focus, it helps you focus where it is. Uh, uh, finally, a, a small point. I think um, safe workplaces are very important, and I think safe health care workplaces are important, and I think there's a real win-win <laughs> here about focusing on prevention of injuries and disabilities to health care workers uh, and, and the benefits to the growth of the system. So I, I want to flip over and ask uh, Dr. Thompson. Uh, uh, you've gotten into uh, some of the stuff that Don mentioned in terms of uh, measuring community and measuring population health in terms of the BMI of students. What's the experience in Arkansas been? I mean, you hear a lot of cacophony about it. You haven't actually decreased the BMI level. Uh. We're, for, for the group, we're in our sixth year of collecting BMI percentiles on every public school student and collecting self-reported health risk appraisal data on 10% of the adult workforce. We've tied that to the claims data, and so we can actually show after a comprehensive strategy, not just in the clinician, clinical secondary environment, but Importantly, in the school environment, the community environment, the built environment, we can show, at least for kids, we have halted the childhood obesity epidemic, not reverse it, but we have to halt it before we can reverse it. Why? Okay. What, did, what, what was the intervention that halted it? Was it this is, is this we measurement? Everything we can think of, we changed the cafeterias in schools, we changed nutrition and physical education in schools. We uh, actually, I guess I'll say this now, we told our physicians how to code for Medicaid to get reimbursement for nutrition counseling. Uh, in, in obese children, which is not something that was allowed originally. Uh, we had done built environment changes. I mean, really, a lot of the things that have been, have been uh, advocated, making health be part of every policy decision, not just those that affect the clinical office, but those that affect where we're going to put a highway and a sidewalk, those that affect our educational environment, those that affect our workplace, to make it be part of every decision to rebalance that calorie caloric equation. Now, to get support for that impact in every environment, we had to tie it to claims data. And we can show that we see a cost difference as early as 10 years of age in our Medicaid and SCHIP program 
between obese and normal weight children on average. And that that escalates to 100% difference by the age of 64 when we deposit them on your doorstep to let Medicare take care of the rest. So, I mean, I think we have brought the business community in, we brought the political community in. We may not have the evidence-based prevention interventions well documented, which is why we did everything we could think of. But we have been able to gain public and political support because of the risk to the state and to the did, did you tax soda like Walt Willett had suggested? Uh, or was that too tough? Arkansas has actually taxed soda for 15 years to pay for a Medicaid program. It was not truth and uh, disclosure. It was not an anti-obesity issue. It was for a funding issue to raise support, financial support for a Medicaid program. For what, how, what do you tax it as? We actually tax the syrup that goes into the fountain drinks at 70 cents per uh, gallon of syrup on the upstream side. I think much of the discussion now is on the bottle of yeah, yeah. Okay. Is there any behavioral response in terms of consumption that you've seen? Because there's been a lot of debate in the literature about how at what level yeah. do you have to tax something to actually have a behavioral reaction. I'm curious, you and others who have thought about this, what, what you would say to that. Well, and also how it affects different populations, the different populations of different consumption patterns. I think three, three of the big questions. We have a, a taxation work group trying to address some of these questions. One, we don't have a whole lot of experience in the soda tax. We're importing much from the tobacco tax. You need about a 10% price differential if you're going to see an impact from uh, on consumption. It is a good revenue stream that we can do. You need to figure out what you're driving people to use as opposed to the soft drinks that you are, are taxing and trying to dissuade the, the consumption of. And uh, what the differential impact on populations may be. Uh, you have to have an environmental availability of an alternative if you're going to tax uh, what is the only source of Dr. Louisa Mori? I, I was, there was actually a review article in the quarterly that just said just about that, so I won't repeat it. But if I could just give you a sense of the magnitude of calories that we're talking about to make a significant change, um, we funded a study that showed by uh, Lanny Mortmaker that shows that roughly 150 to 170 calories, depending on the age of the child, is what you have to take out per day. Per day. We have a question from uh, the internet oh, as we well. Uh, we actually have two. One's a comment, one's a question. Uh, the first is from Scott on Facebook. And he asks, um, or he says, decreasing obesity rates will decrease overall cost. Yes, but that's not a quick fix. We need more. And the second was a comment um, submitted to whitehouse.gov. And it is, a lot of people are suggesting that the typical fee-for-service system doesn't create incentives for doctors to focus on wellness and prevention. Is that true, or is there anything we could do about that? So it's definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Halfman? <coughs> um, I think that the discussion about obesity is talking about the, uh, the importance of multimodal, multi-level, uh, multi-sector approaches to go from the clinical individual behavior all the way up to the policy is what we need to do, clearly. But obesity is not the only time bomb that's ticking away in our population. Thank you. And what we know is that obesity is a developmental disease, the same way as heart disease is a developmental disease, as well as mental health problems. And we know that all these problems start in childhood, develop over time, can be prevented in childhood, but we miss the, the both. As Dr. Hughes pointed out, they're at the bottom of the barrel in terms of preventable mortality, but when you look at the OECD report on children's health and well-being, we're already at the bottom of the barrel there, and the rankings are exactly the same. So the die is cast by the time children enter adulthood in terms of what the relative health status, because the social environment has been deeply embedded into their biology by that point, and we're already on the way to these kinds of health trajectories. And I think what we really need to be thinking about is not just changing the application programs, meaning putting more obesity, you know, new and better obesity programs. I think we have to do that. But what we're really looking at is a change in the operating system. You know, we've been working on an operating system initially that was, I'll call it 1.0 operating system, which was about acute care uh, of disease. We shifted it over to the 2.0, which is about chronic disease care. And that's where our healthcare system is currently focusing. 
most of our energy is about chronic disease. But we should be moving towards an operating system that is really about optimizing the health of everybody, and that means starting early, moving upstream, not just the uh, social determinants of health, but actually the stuff that starts early in life that we know that we can prevent, and that our whole nation is handicapped at this point relative to many other nations because most other nations start their children off on a better health trajectory. And the president could have a three for here. I know he likes two for <laughs> He could have a three for here by linking his prevention agenda, health reform agenda, along with his early childhood agenda. The nation's ready to do that. The other thing that we need to do if we're going to start to change the operating system is we have to think about the kind of nudge strategies and policy jolts that are actually going to take us to the next level, if not to 3.0, at least a 2.2 or 2.5 in terms of what we're doing. And so we need a national prevention agenda that really is about closing the gap in prevention. It means going back to the Healthy People 2020 process, realizing that that has to be done just like Time Magazine did in their recent edition on a life course way so we can see what we need to do. And Healthy People needs to be redone in a way that can be used for the country and be guiding us what we're doing. We should be creating a a uh, National Community Prevention Resource Center because we have great things in Arkansas and great things in Massachusetts and uh, programs in Los Angeles, but all those tools, the health impact assessments, the, the place-based programs, no one's brought it all together. So if you were building the house, you would be buying your hammer in Arkansas and your saw in Massachusetts, but you weren't bringing all this together so that everybody could have all those tools. And we need to do that in a way similar to the way that we did our, uh, our <coughs> uh, agricultural extension programs. We should have, in a sense, prevention extension in every community around the nation, and we have the technology to allow us to have, have. The other thing that we really need to be thinking about relative to this is the role of innovation and how we, how we go in terms of pace and scale of innovating in these areas, because it's not going to happen on its, on its own. So another thing that we should be thinking about is creating a national prevention innovation network that really drives innovation in this area to scale up and spread the kinds of things that work so that we don't have 20 boutique programs around the United States and that we're harvesting what's going on. We have, you know, there's a fixation now on the Harvard, on Harlem Children's Zone, but there's 20 or 30 of those already out there and we need to be harvesting the lessons and the same thing that, that is going on around the state. Well, I think actually part of uh, the president's recovery budget is precisely to take what works at the community level and publicize it. Diane, you were? Yeah, I, I, wanna, I was surprised that you invited me to something about prevention because I'm a palliative care doctor and a geriatrician. Um, but then I thought about you could it prevent pain. and realized that you were smarter than I was because actually there's also prevention of the wrong care. It's a very important component of prevention. And in fact, the money to pay for the care for children and the care for people who are under or uninsured will come from preventing inappropriate care. And the most effective model we have in the United States now, which is nearly at scale and with a little investment could be at scale, is the development of non-hospice palliative care programs in hospitals and in communities. Non-hospice palliative care programs focus not on the people who are dying, who go to hospice, but on the people with advanced chronic illness who are really driving the overwhelming majority of health care costs in this country. Many of those people are getting the wrong care at the wrong place in the wrong time because there are no alternatives in the system. Mm -hmm. And if we simply continue that way with the current incentives, there will be no money to prevent childhood obesity. There will be no money for anything because it's just going to disappear. But if we invest in the workforce, GME exemptions for palliative care training, nurse practitioner programs, loan forgiveness, these are simple, inexpensive fixes, would lead to much broader access to quality palliative care around the country, and would actually make a large and measurable difference in the world, in the current world. Um, I'm an endocrinologist. I'm not a pediatrician. But I think that the only way that we can treat obesity is to prevent obesity. And we have to change the attitude toward food. And I think that one way to do it is to have retired physicians like me going into the elementary schools talking to the children. Uh, children love to talk to doctors and scientists, and they Except really they are needles. great learners. They're great learners. And they take this information back home. So you could start a retired core 
of physicians to go in elementary schools and pre-kindergarten to change the attitude toward food. That's what we have to do. I think obesity is driving much of the uh, sickness in this country, and we have to prevent it rather than treat it, because we do a dismal job of treating it. So let me just add, that's a perfect, our, net, our summer of service. And it would be free. We, that's exactly the kind of thing that the president wanted to initiate with our summer of service and our just generally service initiative. So that's actually something that all of you in leadership organizations could kind of just get organized and use that vehicle to help get out there and do exactly what you're talking about. That's exactly why you signed that And there are plenty of retired physicians around. Yep. Yeah. Um, I want to pick up on the palliative care, really the wrong care um, concern, the unintended consequences and, and wrong care that, that we don't want to wander into. And I think um, relative to our discussion about primary prevention and starting early and aligning, you know, the Institute of Medicine calls for the alignment of uh, or improvements of healthcare through better alignment of what we do, and that includes the economic basis for what we do. And so for primary prevention, there is a misalignment in fee-for-service versus even, even the, the, um, the notion that's gotten a lot of wind and has in some instances makes a lot of sense, which is bundling. For primary prevention, the bundling at the acute care uh, hospital doesn't really give that economic uh, stake to the primary care physician to impact the patient in a prevention, preventative way. So while I'm not a primary care doc, you can see that there's that gap, and you see that in the communities talking with physicians, that how does that work if the alignment with bundling for some diagnoses makes sense? For prevention, it really doesn't because there's no skin in the game. And I want to talk about the secondary prevention uh, that Dr. Berwick um, mentioned and also maybe even tertiary prevention because in my business we deal with the other spike, demographic spike that's happening in the United States and around the world, which is the aging demographics. And we all know that the longer you live, the more likelihood of disease and certainly the more likelihood of disability. And if you just take stroke, for example, which is the leading cause of disability in this country, we know, we've been at, at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, we've been doing studies that show that even if you just get a patient with hemiplegia to walk, that you have a whole, you have a very effective tool for preventing secondary complications and disease. Everything from contractures to spasticity to pain, neurogenic bowel and bladder, pressure sores and so forth. And in fact, there have been studies that show actually walking in individuals with neurologic disease prolongs life and the quality of life which we think is cost effective, although cost improvement or, or overall cost studies haven't been done. So as we think as a country about sort of the notion of bundling, let's not forget that there are, there are uh, unintended consequences in terms of palliative or secondary prevention, rehabilitation care that somehow doesn't fit with that. And I think um, we would be penny wise to pound, and pound foolish, particularly with the aging demographics of this country, to sort of um, cause the acute care paradigm to, to shift patients who have chronic disease or disabling disease to a lower cost setting when in reality the, the cost um, outcome may be disastrous. There are a lot of people in the country that have survived cancer in you know, one form or another type of treatment. We have a lot of them down in Boca Raton and we tried to develop you know, such a system where we have a, a process, a program that they can enter that can be followed along in the future and we didn't know what to call it you know, wellness was a possibility. We ended up calling it a survivorship clinic as opposed to a wellness clinic or anything. And it's worked out really well because we co-locate all the ancillary services for the patient, the physical therapy and occupational therapy, speech therapy. If it's one thing the cancer patients learn to deal with is pain. So we have pain management, you know, tied into we have psychosocial resources, nutrition. And so we run patients through this multimodality evaluation and then we follow them along with time and the, the main goal is to keep them out of the hospital you know it's getting to the point where the hospital is no place for sick people you know and so so by, by keeping a track of them and keeping them under surveillance you end up saving money in the long run because you have such a close you know uh, uh, scrutiny of them and so it could easily be rolled out and in, in other you know chronic disease management systems like congestive heart failure where they enter survivorship programs and that should be cultivated on the oncology side it's been a huge winner for our patients um, it's, first of all, I agree very much with what's been said here today, and I think that some of the comments that Lloyd made earlier about, about prevention being not just a singular issue, but really a comprehensive health reform issue, are really the thoughts that are echoed quite loudly by the thousands of members that, that we have who submit 
all of these comments which you see here today. And in going through these, actually there are a couple of interesting themes which have emerged, which I'm sure you reminded me of. Um, one of them is that there is a critical recognition that for prevention to happen, primary care really needs to be reformed. And it has to be done in such a way that primary care physicians are given the support and the resources to really de 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 deliver prevention. And this is not to say that I think primary care physicians should be the source of all prevention. In fact, I don't think they can or should be. And there, I think there's a greater recognition among many of the people we hear from uh, that the concept of things like the medical home are, are wonderful ones that need to be explored, where we work, we have physicians working with other providers to really extend a lot of the uh, preventive services which can lead to real benefit. Uh, that said, though, there's, I think, a more fundamental issue which has to do with how physicians are trained, which is that we are not trained in medical school and in residency programs to focus on prevention. You know, prevention is not a sexy topic, like the, the, the deploying a stent is, or in, you know, like perhaps yeah, being in the OR and doing surgery. And it's unfortunate because it, a lot of, it leads a lot of uh, medical students and residents away from uh, careers that may focus on prevention. Uh, that culture is really something that we have to change and we have to start fairly early in changing it. The last point I'll make is that in hearing from uh, lots of physicians around the country, one theme does become very clear, that primary care physicians, as many of you know better than most people, primary care docs around the country are feeling demoralized and discouraged about, about practicing medicine. They're feeling discouraged about the difference that they can make in their patients' lives. But that said, many of them are ready to lead and they're ready to contribute their ideas if they're engaged and if they're encouraged. One of the things which I want to commend all of you on and uh, Nancy and DeParlon is on, and the president is really putting together these types of forums to engage physicians. I think it would be wonderful if these types of forums took place in more local communities uh, throughout the country and happen more frequently. I think it would be a fantastic way of actually engaging primary care doctors and all physicians in this process. As someone who left residency <laughs> to come here, if I can ask a follow-up, what what thoughts you, do you, you need have? to finish that and become a primary care doctor? <laughs> <laughs> what thoughts do you have on on changing the training for medical students and residents towards prevention? That's a good question. In primary know. care. Change the location. <laughs> Yes. 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 So, so can, I, can I follow up on that because we've gotten a lot of, in, in our previous sessions where we've had, I would say, more deans than we have today, uh, one of the things we've heard is to do something about the GME payment system to try to encourage getting out of a hospital. Um, does that make sense to people? Yes, uh, yes. yes. So, yeah? There's a wonderful demonstration of this. It, it, that Ron Anderson, who's run Parkland for 25 years, put health care out into the communities. And he decreased the volume of visits to all aspects of the hospital. And Then he got we, fired, right? <laughs> no, he's still there. Uh, we put medical, we put initially put residents in these sites, and then we followed it with medical students. And it's been a terribly rewarding process for them. Uh, it takes a certain kind of physician that can see the patients and teach at the same time. But they have been, they're more than demonstration projects now. And they have become an integral part of the training program. And to add on to what Charles said, actually, I think that the, an important issue here with changing training, which is a question you asked me on, is I, I definitely agree with uh, Judy, and you have to get uh, medical students and residents out of hospitals. We spend the vast majority of our time in the inpatient setting. But the second thing is you have to give medical students role models at a younger age, or earlier in their training. They need to be hearing from physicians who are focused on, on prevention. They need to be seeing people who are doing that for a living. The third thing, though, is there has to be, uh, you know, a, just in terms of subject matter that's taught, a greater focus on, on prevention. When I was a, a first year medical student, I remember spending six weeks on cell biology, which was wonderful. I mean, I like cell biology and <laughs> you as well. Uh, but learned very little about nutrition, learned nothing about lifestyle management. In fact, That's the only thing that was really available yeah. to me about prevention during all my years of medical school was an evening elective that you had to voluntarily sit in on, on nutrition, you know, and which was sparsely attended. <laughs> that kind of culture has to change if we really want to promote uh, physicians who are focused on prevention. As a cell biologist, you break my heart, but I understand. <laughs> but I understand your point. I, I, mean, I want to turn to Dr. Kerfman for a minute because he's been watching this debate from the, the vantage point of somebody who uh, 
kind of creates the medical news and helps disseminate it. I'm curious, we've heard a lot about medical education and the need to change and improve and modernize the approach. Uh, what will it take to, to take the medical profession and have it, it change? Because everybody who's in practice now has been through the current system, and we need to have the current system help lead us to this and actually demand the changes. Because we heard, we've heard today about a litany of breathtaking and inspiring pilots and demonstrations and, you know, the, buying the hammer in Arkansas and the saw in Massachusetts ideas. You know, how do we have the medical profession actually drive the change and demand it from us so that policymakers actually try to keep up with it as opposed to try to enforce it? Yeah, it's a really, really great question. And I think that, uh, let, let me answer it this way. Um, uh, for a number of years, um, I worked as a preventive cardiologist with patients one-on-one -on -one uh, trying to prevent heart disease, uh, working on exercise programs, nutrition, counseling, smoking cessation. Um, and um, from that vantage point, um, I'm, I'm now beginning to see uh, that there are limits to what individual doctors can do. It's very important uh, for individual doctors to, to deliver these preventive messages. But we're here in DC, we're here in the seat of government, and it, we, shouldn't under, uh, wonder, uh, we shouldn't underestimate, I think, the role that legislation has to play to put teeth into preventive health care. Now, last week, historic legislation was passed, as all of you know. Uh, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act uh, was passed. Uh, presumably, it will be signed by the president. And I, I think this is going to be a, a very important piece of legislation for preventive medicine. We endorsed it. Uh, we wrote about it in the journal. Uh, we'll continue to write about it and promote uh, this approach uh, to prevention. It's a very strong bill. If you read the bill, there's a lot of detail there. We can do the same with sugared beverages. I agree with Walter Willett. I think that this is going to be an important approach. Uh, and we can do it in other ways, too, labeling foods in restaurants so people know how many calories are in there, going along with the color coding that was mentioned uh, previously. So finally, let me mention just one or two things about the journal, the New England Journal, that first of all, we are very committed to publishing articles on health care reform. Uh, we've been trying to keep on top of health care reform every week, uh, publishing articles online, uh, in print, to capture uh, this very important story, but also the story of uh, preventive medicine. Uh, and uh, so I just want to open our door to all of you uh, that if you have things that you want to communicate, uh, get in touch with me uh, because we really want to promote uh, these ideas. Uh, Dr. Wazel, you, you, you've been <laughs> asking for a while to jump in. So. Well, I just want to, I want to pick up on that and also on something that Vivek said, which is to answer your question about how, how to change the culture and, and how, how physicians can change the culture. And one of the things we hear a lot from our doctors is that uh, we have a series of payment reform house meetings across the country where doctors got together and, and talked about what they would like to see. Uh, and, and some really interesting things came out of that. One of the things, a, a complaint or a problem that people kept raising over and over again was the fragmentation of care. And, and we heard it from all doctors, especially primary care physicians, uh, that the care was fragmented. They didn't see the same patients. They didn't see their patients continuously. And, and the second series of comments that we heard was that people, doctors, could focus a lot more on preventive care if they had long-term relationships with their patients. They support this comprehensive reform. They support medical homes and the ability to have help deliver preventive care, but they really need that relationship. Um, and I think that a lot of doctors feel that that's a very important part of being able to deliver preventive care as well. So I, I wanted to, uh, one of the things we've done at our, some of our previous uh, meetings with physicians is to try to get a sense of the group for some of these. And I want to pick up on one that I think was mentioned, uh, and I'm not exactly sh sure I can recall who mentioned it, because, but it's here in my, which is this question of doing uh, HRAs, health risk assessments, uh, on a widespread group of people, whether, and so I want to ask it in uh, uh, three parts. Um, the first part is, Ought we to require in some way, again, you know, we are the federal government, uh, physicians to do this as a standardized part of their interaction with patients? 
Uh, I know that when I was trained, we didn't actually uh, necessarily make it a standardized part. Uh, is it something we ought to require all physicians to do? So if you would raise your hands if you think it's something we, and again, require is a pretty strong thing uh, that we ought to do. require somebody to do it or require physicians? Well, I'm asking physician. Okay. I mean, we could ask, we could. The system, yeah. yeah, the system. <laughs> I want to ask, at the physician the level, with yes. their patients, ought they to do it? They ought to, and I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. so Could you raise your hands yes. if you think we ought to require it? Yes. Yes. All right. So, so, so hands, though, would be how we Hands is how, yes. Boy, these are. But it also needs to be paid for. Not a lot of people. For. Okay, so I'm going to switch and around. you have to have time. Ought, ought we to require uh, the health care uh, system in some way, yeah. not necessarily physicians, but nurse practitioners or hospitals, <coughs> a little more support for that. Well, uh, I want to, well, I want to shift for a second. Another place we could have this done, and um, some of you may know that the president held a series of meetings with employers who uh, do a lot of health promotion in their workplace, is to require employers to begin doing these kind of wellness things and maybe uh, a requirement is the health risk assessment uh, on the employers. Ought we to require employers to do this? Number of people? I'd rather incent them. Okay. I'm, I'm for all of the above. All right. Um, the the last this. thing I'd like to ask, and again, focusing in on the, uh, it is interesting that we're not so wild about requiring the employers. And from what we can gather, only about 11% do wellness on a consistent basis. Um, is uh, schools, requiring schools to do something like maybe what uh, Dr. Thompson has done in Arkansas, measure the BMI and send it home. Is that something we ought to sort of With a require? package of other interventions. Right. I think just yeah, on BMI alone, but, but having an, <clears throat> an educational curriculum interactive. If it's okay. isolated, if it's an isolated process, it would be terrible. What, what do you do? What, you you mm -hmm. measure BMI and you, you send it home. Confidentially send it home in a health report to parents. In the process of incorporating every other screening that occurs at school, vision, hearing, scoliosis, developmental screens, and putting that into a separate health report to link the education community with the That intervention. How many people support that? Uh, so that gets as close as we're to our comprehensive uh, uh, intervention and pretty widespread uh, support. Zeke, the concept that I would offer is the, the requirement to assess risk carries with it a burden on the requirer to then offer help That's with respect right. to the risks assessed. If you separate them, it's, it's not going to help. But, and I, I well, would like to go a step further. Great. If, if we require a provider to do X, the mm -hmm. expectation is that somehow we will pay, pay for yeah, that. Well. And I think you're just reinforcing the fee for service or quantity. Mm -hmm. um, if you make, you know, pay people for outputs, it doesn't guarantee that you will see the outcome. So I would much rather create a system that rewards uh, maybe consumers and providers for achieving certain outcomes, like decreasing by 10% the percentage of their people who have BMIs over, um, rather than paying them to do individual health screening or health risk assessments have something on the other end that we're helping to support with the way we pay. So you'd rather pay for outcomes? Uh, yeah. Which would presumably require yes. you to measure <coughs> the yeah. HRAs How going we in. get to those outcomes should be in many ways defined by the group of providers who are working together, the communities that they're in, and, uh, but I, I think if we pay for widgets, we'll get Dr. Chen, you've had your binders open for a while with comments. So <laughs> I have multiple comments on every every topic. I can uh, I can pull somebody up on each one of them. Um, let's see who should I who should I choose here? Um, I mean, I think I think an, an an important point, kind of as I'm as I'm flipping through with these binders with all of these ideas and and and, and issues that people have is that is that people out there do do have these ideas that everyone that that are our providers on the ground Janet Shaw says she's she's from Phoenix Arizona she says as a physician and a patient with a chronic condition I can't think of too many things that are more important than a system that prioritizes well-funded primary care as a centerpiece of health care and I have uh, Susan Wilder Wilder from Scottsdale Arizona who's saying 
Prevention and wellness are critical and span education, workplace, community service, and medical arenas. And the reason I'm re kind of reading these out loud is, is because I, I feel like physicians, for the most part, know what, know what we're trying to do. We're trying to get our patients to be healthy. And, and rather than saying, well, now we have a requirement that you do a, a health assessment, or now we have a requirement of this and that and this and that, is, is that there are so many, so many things that are, that are not working in the system that are, that are creating an environment where, they, where all of our physicians who say that what they're trying to do is take care of their patients, that what we need to do is get rid of all of the extraneous parts of the system that are keeping us from being able to provide that care, rather than adding on a lot of other requirements. Can I so, just interject where we started out and one of the questions that were, what was raised, where do we add more, about two more hours to everyone's 24 hour day uh, so that they can then access all this preventive care? And I didn't hear that as we talked about education of the doctors and the and kids. Where are we then going to also set aside some time so that maybe as we demand that employers provide health insurance, that they also then are required to do something in terms of giving an incentive to allow that patient or that person to take some time to access the preventive care. Mm -hmm. Have we had any discussion about that? Good point. Okay. It's a great point. <coughs> well, could I follow up on that a little bit? That uh, It's interesting that many of the leading corporations in the United States have developed quite sophisticated employee wellness programs and uh, they find there's great dollar return for investment on those, and some of them actually pay the patient, the, their employees back uh, some of the savings there. So in some cases, that's the real test that prevention actually can save a lot of money. Uh, but one- and the, But the interesting thing, we do have to flip it around. A lot, only 11% do it, and it turns out to be a handful. I mean, we have met and we have studied this pretty extensively, and it, I mean, it's a limited number that have actually done it despite what does appear to be a consistent theme about the return on investment. Yeah, lot, right, and a lot of them, well, you, you know all the reasons why uh, some of them don't, but I want to point out that uh, one of the biggest enterprises, businesses in America are healthcare systems, and very, very few have implemented these. And I was just struck being in the Brigham Women's Hospital quite a bit the last few weeks. Uh, it's very clear the employees, staff, uh, professionals, and non-professionals are very much a brunt uh, uh, participants in the obesity epidemic. It's, it's rather horrifying. And that's going to have, it's bad for them, it's a bad example for patients. It's clearly running up costs in healthcare because of uh, uh, unhealthy employees. And I go down to the food service, and they're being fed the fuel for the obesity epidemic. And uh, we, this, we really should be doing the best. And actually, the federal government could have very strong levers there to require institutions that receive federal funding for uh, patient care actually have good employee health services. One other point that we've talked a lot about some of the inadequacies of the data on uh, how we uh, implement preventive services in the primary care health setting, and part of it is, the reason for that is there's been very minimal research funding for that. Robert Wood Johnson has started to put some funding into that. But uh, compared to what we invest in drugs and procedure re type research, minuscule, and it would be really important. It doesn't have to be a very big piece of money, but to have some funding stream for that. All right. We have, unfortunately, only 10 minutes left, and <coughs> one of the things I'd like to do is to go rapid fire around the horn for your last very brief comments, and it has to be very brief because at least four of us have a very important meeting right after this that we uh, unfortunately cannot miss. Um, and we want to give everyone, uh, maybe we'll start at the right and go around to the left. Uh, so, uh, I was all prepared. <laughs> okay. So, Dr. Ginsburg. I, I, I would uh, wish that any targeted educational programs would start before middle school and start with preschool children. I think anybody who's thought about this, the worst thing you can have is a three-year-old hocking you all the time. Uh, and, and I think we've not done well with the youngest in our society. And I think it will be exponential. Good. I think one thing that's become clear to me over the last couple of months is that, is that physicians want to do preventive care. They want to promote wellness and they just need help. And I think health comes in the form of the restructured system and also uh, education information about what works, what doesn't work, and how to implement it. 
So that's what people are asking for. We've talked a lot about obesity. We haven't talked a lot about uh, tobacco use and uh, what we can do to move further to be a smoke free nation. And I think in terms of prevention, that's going to be a big concern. We have a wealth of physicians and the physician patient interface is sacrosanct. It's inside of a system that's built on a one year annual contract that is quick selling everybody. And if you could stabilize that and have a longer term perspective on financing, you would actually get investment for longer term issues like prevention as opposed to acute care focus on how we drive today's dollar in the It's really about the money. The money is in the treatment of chronic disease, and we have to have a new model and tool for treating chronic disease that will be a catalyst and lever for a lot of change, including new injury, primary care, which is patients. I grew to uh, team to do this, and then also will create a tremendous amount of accountability by paying only for results. So all of a sudden, the outcomes will be a great primary care, create a catalyst for change in our culture of wellness by one simple thing, reimbursing lifestyle treatment of chronic disease. Um, I agree with that. I think uh, if you decide what you want the outcome to be, you should design plans to achieve that. I would also just like to emphasize um, that there is a great opportunity here to um, form partnerships and marry um, interventions that we do in healthcare or medical settings with public health and community health approaches. And um, we should try very hard not to continue to separate those interventions. My comment is on messaging. Uh, I think it's right to put cost, controlling cost growth first, front and center. But I think many people hear that as rationing, they hear it as less healthcare to go around. I would repackage that as efficiency because, you know, as you know, it's very possible to spend less money per capita on healthcare, but at the same time deliver more effective healthcare, more real healthcare to more Americans. I would just like to point out that a recent survey showed that more than 70% of Americans think that prevention should be in health reform even if it costs money. Uh, we agree with that. We have to remember that that's both clinical, effective clinical preventive services and the effective community preventive services. And I think we just have to really make sure that the concerns about cost don't mean that prevention gets dropped by the wayside as we move forward with health prevention. So I just like to urge the, the president of the state firm and real health reform service. <laughs> 30-second actionable idea. We are piloting a grandparent core for the delivery of preventive consulting out of federally qualified health centers in addition to using the American College of Cardiology and knowing how to lift people who have been discharged with heart failure to remind them daily wakes, medication adherence. Um, we're paying them and uh, we're doing it right now through a grant. But the use of community health workers actually in the last time I looked, there is a grandparent in the White House. Um, <laughs> there, uh, the idea of a whole overall community health worker grandparent for the work on. We can talk about health reform till we're blue in the face, but if we don't talk about medical and nursing education and prepare a workforce to deliver health care of the kind that we want, we're going to have people over here doing interventional cardiology while we're trying to build different centers. So the business case for medical education and medical schools needs to be fixed. The business case is towards cardiology, oncology, you know, complex surgeries, and away from primary care, geriatrics, palliative care, because the medical school and hospitals connected to it can't survive um, under the current model. So until those incentives are changed, we will not have a workforce to deliver the preventive and primary care. Comments we from had, uh, over a thousand comments and questions submitted during this discussion on Facebook and on WhiteHouse.gov. So thank you to all of the people around the country watching this discussion. And um, one comment I'll end on is uh, poverty prevents people from eating properly. It is cheaper to buy junk food than healthy food. This needs to change. One solution is community gardens. Everyone helps to maintain the garden and all enjoy the fruits of their labor. And I think that speaks to the president's um, summer service initiative called United We Serve. And if you go to serve.gov, you can actually find guides on how to start a community garden. There's a back to school health guide, how you can promote children's health in your own community. And there's also um, a guide for seniors to start walking clubs. So I think there are you know, ways that every American can help improve the health of, of their community. And certainly the online participants talked about that a lot today.
Mr. Beck? Well, you know, first, I just want to say I really enjoyed this discussion today. Uh, and, uh, you know, as somebody who was trained in a primary care program, it, it heartens me to see uh, a president in office and the administration that are really focusing on bringing prevention to the forefront. I think we have an incredible opportunity here to actually harness uh, the intellect and the innovation of many types of healthcare providers, physicians and others, uh, in solving this problem. I think we need to do so as well, and that if we don't, all the ideas and solutions that we come up with uh, will fail, because they won't be people to actually implement them and ensure that they have it. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to really engage uh, physicians and other healthcare providers, and I hope that all of us can work together to really do that. For over 114 years, the National Medical Association has included in its mission the promotion of health and wellness in our communities as well as the elimination of health disparities. So our organization definitely stands by the president with respect to trying to focus more on wellness prevention and trying to eliminate that the health care problems that we have right now in our communities. Um, since 1932, only 1 to 3% of our health care budget was spent on prevention. That number has unchanged. And it's really time to move from being a sick care uh, system to a health care system. And it means mobilizing uh, health in all policies and health across all sectors of society. I think that we have some unique opportunities. And, and again, thank you so much for the ability to uh, participate. Um, one third of Americans are enrolled in some sort of federal program, whether it's uh, Medicaid or Medicare, uh, federal employees program, the military system. And these could serve as real laboratories for being able to put in place many of the, the, the cost saving uh, preventive interventions uh, that were discussed at all levels uh, in, in terms of uh, primary prevention, secondary, and tertiary. Also, in terms of establishing that prevention and wellness fund. Um, hopefully, there could be the creation of new innovative mechanisms to spend money across agencies, across uh, silos, to come up with some innovative ways of delivering uh, community preventive interventions. And then, lastly, accumulating this knowledge, because there's a 15-year science to service gap between the time of a new discovery and its wide dissemination in the community. In the information age, why shouldn't that be 15 seconds? And so by, by really gathering all that information together in a, in a, in a website, in an interactive one, in social networking, um, maybe we can speed the time, uh, accelerate the time of prevention to the community. If we're going to uh, fund the prevention system in the future and improve efficiencies, uh, we need to, uh, and also build not just medical homes or medical neighborhoods, but really healthy communities, which I think is what we have to embed all that in. I think we need a dedicated, protected, flexible funding stream, the Prevention Investment Fund or Prevention Trust Fund, with, that is organized around a sort of business model so that you have core, core fund that goes to states, you have transformation monies that states can apply for to do major transformation, and you have innovation funds that can only be used for cross-sector kinds of stuff. And I would fund that with a one-cent tax on consumption of medical care, which would generate about $15 billion if we just tax personal health care expenditures. It would be a mini bath, see? But it, what, what it would do... We know how lucky, likely that is to happen. I know. All right. <laughs> but it would be like the gas tax in the sense that it would, what we would be doing is taxing medical, medical consumption to invest in prevention. Thanks. Okay. Tremendous uh, array of wonderful comments today. Just one general note, I, I find it helpful to think of obesity in some of these conditions not as a disease, but actually as a symptom of a disease society. And if we really fix, fix uh, find solutions that really get at the root causes, we will be doing a lot more than just preventing diseases. We will actually be improving the quality of life every day for everybody in this country. And in yeah. some ways, that's the most important thing. Millions of people, based on their previous activities, are already predestined to have some catastrophic or chronic illness prematurely in their overall life destiny. And the coordinated effort to develop survivorship and wellness programs would stand them in very good stead to, to be able to manage them efficiently in a cost-effective way as they go through years and years and years of post-therapy uh, you know, uh, 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 treatments. And radiation oncology would love to assist in that process. I defer to my members. Um, to my member physician. So Dr. Proustoup says, honestly, the best prevention is giving people health insurance. If they don't have health insurance, they'll be deterred from participating in prevention and wellness initiatives. 
You can prevent a disease early on from progressing to a more severe outcome with worse consequences. Billions could be saved. And what Dr. Todd in Albuquerque, New Mexico says, he says, I would love to talk to someone who can make a difference. And I want to thank you and the, and the President for, for allowing us to come here, for allowing my, my stack of, of, of doctors, my 13,000 doctors across the country, and for, for allowing everyone to be a part of this process. And the message is that we're ready, and we're ready to be a part of the solution. I'd ask the President to articulate a small number of quantitative, bold goals for the improvement of health status of American communities to be implemented at the community level, and I'd like him to ask the federally sponsored care systems, VA, DOD, federally qualified health centers, and, uh, and the Indian Health Service to be in the lead in achieving those. Uh, I practice in a uh, county where there's a lot of poverty and, and pathology, and it's underserved. and. Uh, I just hope the President and the Administration remembers that when you're already working under a handicap, we have certain needs that other places might not. Uh, we've talked a lot about preventing obesity. We haven't talked anything about preventing accidents, especially in teenagers. And uh, two of the things I think we could do, physicians could certainly ask their teenagers if they use seat belts, because we've had a number of accidents in this area where teenagers have died and they did not have their seat belts on. And the other thing is that, can we outlaw cell phones? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other thing is alcoholism in children. And I, I'm going to confine my uh, comments to alcoholism rather than other uh, drugs because alcohol is uh, legal. Uh, and we have a lot of children who are alcoholics. In our <clears throat> coronary disease prevention program, it was nurses who did the health, health assessments and delivered a lot of the preventive care. And while I'm confident that we can rebuild the primary care structure in our country, and we need to do that, uh, nurses can do a lot uh, to do preventive care. Uh, and I think that we need to tap, uh, tap into that very valuable resource. I think um, long-term and short-term, well, the longer-term integrated community of physicians, hospitals, and so forth working together is a, is a much better but longer-term solution. I'm just going to suggest a shorter philosophical framework for a shorter term because it seems like we're, um, the president is obviously on a fast track. We currently pay uh, for health care based on the facility that you're in or the procedure that you get, and that's just wrong. We have to realign the payment. The dollars have to basically mm -hmm. be aligned with the entities that influence the outcomes we want to achieve. We know that in every industry, in every business, if you align the economics with the outcomes you want to achieve, usually you'll get them. So I think on the short order, although it's painful, if we reframe our thinking and think instead of facility or venue-based, base it on diagnostic diagnosis or long-term episode of care and the outcome you want to achieve. And then relative to physician piece, let's move some of the high-end procedure, click it, ticket, sort of uh, high, uh, currently valued or high price uh, procedure-based um, payment to the primary care docs and the, the docs who are in the trench is going to make an impact on the longer-term vision that we have. To me, it's just the simple realignment of the payment on a short-term basis will help us to achieve the longer-term much more integrative, much more robust, and hopefully quality and outcome-based system. Lloyd, last word. Yes, I would say that a lot of what we discussed today, which was phenomenal, were uh, programmatic uh, kinds of things. And I'm very concerned uh, about the policy aspect and that some of these ideas become institutionalized, become uh, policies. Uh, secondly, I would say that one of the things that I'm struck by, that when we just here and in other venues, when we talk about uh, wellness, when we talk about prevention, uh, there's not the bridge to quality. And I think that quality must be redefined to include um, uh, prevention uh, and wellness. And finally, I would say that um, although we often come in on, on one end of it when patients present themselves in terms of the, the hospitals, that we as providers are poised and, and get it uh, and ready to step up um, on the prevention and wellness side way before uh, someone touches uh, our uh, campuses. And, I, and finally, last word is that 
All of our discussion, in my opinion, is for naught if we don't all use our voices in every effort that we have to keep uh, the reform initiative alive and get it done because wellness will not move forward uh, on its own. It's got to be a part of a comprehensive reform effort. With that, uh, great uh, call. We want to thank you all for coming and offering your ideas. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to stay in touch. And I think uh, we'll be able to try to advance some of these ideas uh, uh, as we move forward. So thank you very much. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. <laughs> In nice meeting you too. Oh, I'm gonna get a list.